I was uh, very fortunate to succeed Lou Fry in the seat that represented uh, Central Florida. Uh, Lou had been a tremendous congressman uh, representing the interest of this constituency very well and only because he vacated the seat uh, did I have an opportunity to run and uh, it was uh, a time when uh, Central Florida was just uh, so exciting, it still is, but I mean we were on the cusp of, of doing a lot of the great things in the space program. Uh, we had this tremendous growth here and the question of management of that growth. Uh, so many of the things that uh, made Central Florida a desirable place to live and all of that excitement with the newfound technological revolution that was going on. Uh, if I ever did a good day's work, one of the things that I did as congressman was to persuade the United States Navy, which in fact had then the Orlando Naval Training Center, which is where Baldwin Park is being developed today when the Navy base was shut down uh, some 15 years ago. And by the way, where Mel Martinez and I both live, uh, and persuade the United States Navy that they should take the technological part of their base, which at the time was called the Naval Training Equipment Center, make it more into what was becoming, because of the technological revolution, using technology for simulation, move that out of the old World War II buildings that were on the base and move it into brand new facilities and become the anchor tenant for the Central Florida Research Park. I worked on that thing night and day to the point at which the Navy kept dragging its feet and although that I had talked to the top Navy Admiral called the Chief of Naval Operations and he had agreed verbally I would turn around and nothing would get done. And literally, the way we got it done, he signed an order 15 minutes before he was retiring. That's how close it came. And then, of course, the rest is history. We have a major simulation center here that is not only the Navy, but is also the Army, some Air Force, uh, the Marines, uh, and simulation has become so important. As a matter of fact, I have the, the military pilot trainers tell me that the simulators are so good these days that they can actually teach a student to fly so that the first time that the student gets in the trainer aircraft, that they can take it around in the pattern. And uh, that's uh, just one example. There's another company, for example, here in Orlando that in the realization that so many air traffic controllers are getting to the age that they're going to be retiring over the course of the next seven years, they're going to have to train enormous numbers of air traffic controllers. And you know what a harrowing and very precise job that is. Well. Now, instead of taking up the time in the actual tower, before they ever get that hands-on experience, they can train in a simulated tower that has all the different kind of scenarios and emergencies that would occur for an air traffic controller. And that's just another example of the application. And a lot of that is centered right here just to the south of this campus in the research park and as a result it being the anchor tenant you can see what all else uh, took off. When I ran for Congress and, and I can't say enough good things about Lou, I was this little kid from the coast from scenic Melbourne 
And I had been in elected office for six years in the state legislature. And in 1972, when I was first elected, I had tried something new in the way of campaigning. And that was, back in those days, the causeways from the mainland to the barrier island was a two-lane road, usually with a drawbridge. Well, because it was two-lane, the traffic would go fairly slow. So my wife and I cooked up this idea that we would get this, this sign that said, Hi, I'm Bill Nelson running for, in this case, it was the legislature. And I would go stand out on that causeway, and I could have a personal encounter with everybody that came through, because I'd look them straight in the eye, and I'd say, good afternoon, ma'am, good afternoon, sir, give them a little wave. And it, of course, it just, it just went over exceptionally well. Well, six years later, when I'm getting ready to run for Congress, I'm thinking, you know, is, is this really going to go over? Orlando's much more sophisticated. Uh, are they going to think I'm some little hick coming over? And, of course, there weren't causeways in Orlando. But what I did was I found two of my favorite corners. One was Colonial and Bumby, and the other one was Orange and Michigan. And the way the intersections were configured at that time by standing on one corner and then moving as the traffic, just moving back and forth, maybe about 10, 15 feet on the corner, I could have direct eye contact with almost all of the traffic that went by. And I'll never forget that first day that I got out there on uh, Colonial and Bumby. And it was in the middle of the day, and people started going nuts. They'd never seen this before, where a kid was out there fighting the wind and the sun beating down and having this personal encounter with people, and especially young men in construction trucks go by, and they'd just go nuts. Well, it took off, and uh, fortunately, we had a, a real good margin in that race uh, for Congress. And then I did something different. The day after the election, I went back out on the street corners and on the causeways, this time with a thank you sign. And I did that for three days straight, and I covered every intersection in the congressional district that I had already campaigned on. Well, the idea caught on so much that the next time an election came two years later, there were so many candidates out on the street corners, I couldn't even find a street corner to stand on. <laughs> and thus, you see that uh, that is one of my legacies. Uh, it, uh, it also is uh, when you're a candidate, when you offer yourself for public office, you force yourself to do things that you would never do. Uh, just going door to door. Uh, and we had divided up the congressional district into neighborhoods, and we called it the Nelson's Neighbors Campaign. And literally, I knocked on most of the doors. In a, in a constituency the size of a congressional district, although it's a stretch because it's a lot of work, but it's realistic to get 80% of the households in a state the size of Florida, 18 million. You just couldn't even begin to do that. But there was so much that I would learn. Uh, you could learn with all the senses at the front door. You could even learn with the sense of smell by the smells that were coming out of the household. And people were absolutely flabbergasted that a politician was taking the time to come to the front door I'll never forget there was a, a house on Sarno Road in Melbourne that I had gone up to, and it was one of those old 1950s-style houses that had the big uh, picture window in the front on the little uh, front porch that you walked across 
in front of the plate glass window to get to the front door. And I knock on the door, and it doesn't appear that anybody's home. And, and, and it was one of those doors that had the glass that you could look through that was about uh, face high. And I look through there, and suddenly I am looking at this huge Doberman pincer. And so I put my little door hanger on there to say, sorry, I missed you. And I started backing away, and that dog took a running leap and hit that plate glass window. And the only reason the dog didn't come through was there was a screen on the outside of the plate glass window, but of course it shattered. I'm not sure I got that household's votes. <laughs> Grace and I had literally come off of our honeymoon in 1972, and a seat in the state legislature had opened up. And so here's this brand new bride, and she's out there campaigning with her husband. And we're going door to door. And it didn't take me too long to realize that I was really wasting her time because she was so good. Uh, so I put her over on the other side of the street, and we'd go down both sides of the street, and we could cover twice as much territory in the same amount of time. And Grace, as this brand new bride, was absolutely intent on getting every vote. And she came to this house. Now, by the way, everything I'm telling you is absolute true story, and I could go on all day, and I won't. We'll get to the subject at hand. But there are memories that are so etched uh, in your memory. This was one of them. She could not get to the front door because the sprinklers were on. But the garage door was open. So she marched in the garage door, and there's the back door inside the garage, and she rings the doorbell. Only it's not the doorbell. It's the automatic garage door closer. <laughs> now, this is 1972 when lights didn't have to come on. When the garage door came back, she runs back just as the door closes, she's in this pitch dark garage wondering what to do. She said, if I can just make my way back over to the door and bang on the door, maybe somebody's home. And so, of course, she's stumbling over bicycles and lawnmowers, and she finally gets over there just hoping and praying somebody's there. And sure enough, a gentleman of the house came, opened the door. There's Grace in his dark garage, and she said, sir, will you vote for my husband? <laughs> And so it's been a, a lifetime like that, a very fulfilling lifetime of public service. And now you have accorded me the, the great privilege of representing Florida uh, in the United States Senate. The topic, of course, that we just came through so sadly last week when we were in session two weeks ago and, of course, that continue, this saga, this drama continues, is the Terry Schiavo situation. The one result that is coming out of this is that during this Easter recess that we've been home, I have been calling other senators to get them to join with me in the legislation that I filed a year ago in promoting living wills for a family to get into a situation like this where the animosities develop between close loved ones uh, is just a great tragedy. And you see how it's played out, and you see how it's gotten into the political arena. You see also that at the end of the day, the rule of law has prevailed instead of a rule of men. And that's an important lesson to learn out of this. As tragic as this is, and as hope for that we can now promote living wills, and my legislation is to take the point of contact in the buying of a driver's license where you are already under law ask if you want to be an organ donor. 
and to have that point of contact for all ages to be given information and encouragement to fill out a living will so that a situation like this does not occur. Grace and I have a living will. Last night, we sat down with our two children, who are 28 and 29, and went through the questions that should be answered with regard to them having a living will. Out of this tragic situation, the rule of law has prevailed even though it is as controversial as it is and as hardened as people are in their positions. We saw a similar situation occur four years ago when in a state that happened to be our state, it was virtually dead even and the result was going to decide who was the next president. The Florida Supreme Court took up the issue and said, count the votes. And all of the different people around the state, back in the supervisor of elections office, continued the recount. And four hours later, the United States Supreme Court, on a five to four decision, said stop counting the votes. Whether you agree with that decision or not, which obviously I do not, but the highest court in the land spoke and we accepted it and it was the rule of law. We saw some serious challenges to the rule of law over the course of the last several months with regard to this. We're going to see some more in the future. And one that is brewing is the question of whether or not the Senate rules of procedure are going to be changed, not according to the Senate rules, which if you're going to change the Senate rules, it provides that you have to have 67 of the 100 senators to change the rules. But instead... The majority leader, Bill Frist, the White House, have cooked up a plan that on a technicality, they will put Dick Cheney in the chair as president of the Senate, which is a constitutional role that is played by the vice president. And on a technical ruling, on a motion from the majority leader, the, the Republican leader, he will rule that the procedure on whatever the issue is, in this case, they say the appointment of the seven appellate judges who have not been confirmed, 204 have been confirmed. But of those seven, that they say that the rules of the Senate will be changed and a senator will not be able to stand up and speak as long as he or she wants, what is otherwise known as the filibuster. The Senate, over its history, had no rules for breaking a filibuster. It was not until early in the last century, in the 20s or 30s, that the Senate rules were changed and 67 votes would break the filibuster. Later on in the 1960s, that number of votes required for what is called a motion of cloture or to close off debate required 60 senators. And that's what the Senate rules now provide. The technical change is a change to make that a majority vote of 51. Benjamin Franklin, upon the close of the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, had left the convention as it adjourned and was approached by a woman on the streets of Philadelphia who said, Dr. Franklin, 
do we have a republic or do we have a monarchy? Benjamin Franklin replied, Madam, we have a republic if we can keep it. And over the course of 217 years under our constitutional government, which started in 1789, we have seen the genius of those founding fathers in the checks and balances so that we would not move to what Europe was at the day, a monarchy, or in the case of Britain, the experience where the monarchy was overthrown and the parliament came, became supreme. Instead, that one would check the other in a division of power, a separation of power, and those two would be checked by an independent judiciary. And each in the checks and balances would avoid the concentration of power in any one person's or one institution's hands. And it's worked pretty good for 217 years. And even in the legislative branch, we saw that the designers of the Constitution said that the only way you can pass a bill that then goes for law with a signature by the president or that becomes law by overriding with a two-thirds vote the president's veto is that you've got to pass the identical piece of legislation in both bodies of the Congress. And one of those bodies is going to be reflective of the population at large, the House of Representatives. And this, of course, was the great compromise in the Constitutional Convention that almost caused it to blow up. The other one was going to equally represent the states with two senators per state. And in the development of that separation of powers and checks and balances, the Senate became, because of the six-year terms, the more studied opinions, the lack of the hot inflammation of emotions in passing legislation because of the ability to speak at length, became the check and balance to the rush to judgment of legislation that came out of the House. Ladies and gentlemen, this is facing us right now. It is what you're hearing on TV referred to as the nuclear option, which most people don't have any clue what that means. What it means is what I just said. Is the Senate going to continue with their rules, changing their rules as provided by the rules or under a technicality, are we suddenly going to eliminate the ability of a senator to take the floor and to speak as long as he can physically speak? And if they do it for these appellate judges, who says that the ne next subject that comes along, that they won't do it the same? You're going to hear a lot about this. It's my hope, and I think that there are a number of Republican senators like John McCain and Chuck Hagel and Lincoln Chafee and Olympia Snow and Susan Collins and maybe George Voinovich and Mike DeWine that are not going to go along with it and therefore that they won't even get the 51 votes. But that's going to be a hot topic for the future, so stay tuned. Now to the subject at hand, and I'll conclude and open it up to your questions. It's called the mother's milk of politics. The problem is that when it gets so expensive to run a campaign, particularly in a big state like Florida, which has 10 media markets, in a big state like Florida where the stations will charge you the highest commercial rate even though they say they will charge you the lowest commercial rate and they will but you don't have any guarantee it's going to run on the six o'clock news they may run it at two o'clock 
in the morning. So if you want that guaranteed slot, you see why campaigns have become so expensive. It cost me $13.5 million in my election to the Senate. Eleven and a half of that was spent just on television airtime. This time we're looking at a race that will cost us $18 million. And most of that will be television airtime. Until we change, either by public financing, which the votes aren't there and the American people are not there, so that's not going to happen. Or that we do lower the cost of television advertising and radio to candidates. And that's not going to happen anytime soon because the broadcasters don't want that to happen. Until one of those two things happen, we're going to continue to go on with the cost of campaigns as it is. And as a result, you're seeing that even though we passed what is known as McCain-Feingold, which was going to take away what was known as soft money, which was unlimited uh, corporate and union contributions as well as individual contributions, unlimited, for federal elections, they will always find a way to get around it as they have with the provisions of these independent groups called 527s. Interestingly, for state races, although Florida has a campaign finance law that says it's a limit of $500 per contribution, but the law also provides that unlimited monies of any kind can be sent through the political party as a conduit for paying all of the expenses of a candidate running for statewide office. And as a result, you can see that virtually there are no limits there then under state of Florida law. And it desperately needs it. And I'll conclude with telling you that we're going to try. John McCain and Russ Feingold are both, uh, in fact, going to try to limit the amount and the influence of these so-called independent groups, 527 groups, name that because it's Section 527 of the Internal Revenue Code, We're going to try to limit their ability to influence elections as they had. But money in campaigns is like water. It's very difficult to contain it, and it flows through all the crevices and crannies to find its ultimate low point in the sense of gravity. All right, Ed, let me just stop right there, and I'll be happy to take uh, some questions. You've been in Congress a number of years, and I was just wondering how television, Internet, and other media outlets have influenced either campaigns or how campaigns are run, or even the quality of people running and how that's affected um, elections now? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question because the implication of the question is because campaigns are so expensive, is it just people that are rich that are running? When, it's one thing to run for Congress. When I was running for Congress, I think my first campaign for Congress cost about $200,000. Today, I mean, it's standard fare that it's costing a million dollars just to run for Congress. Now, can you raise that? Yes, you can raise that. But you get in a big state like Florida and having to stretch to $18 million as well as people, uh, that's tough. So at this particular point, you know, uh, guess what I'm doing a lot of? I'm raising money. Your question also foretells an interesting thing. Look at the people in the Senate. This last time that I was elected in 2000, look how many were very wealthy individuals that funded their own campaign. 
Uh, in one case, uh, Hillary Clinton, she's a special case. She was basically self-funding because of her fame and the immediate ability to draw from her years of exposure as the First Lady, plenty of money. But look at the others that were elected. Maria Cantwell in Michigan, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, state of Washington, self-funded from a personal fortune that she had built up with a high-tech company. Mark Dayton, elected in the state of Minnesota, uh, a part of the Dayton department stores, self-funded. And he took eight or nine million dollars out of his own pocket and funded his campaign. And then, of course, the classic example was John Corzine in New Jersey, uh, who was worth about a half a billion dollars. He had been the head of Goldman Sachs, and he spent north of $60 million of his own resources, running in a state, by the way, New Jersey, that is very expensive because they have to buy New York television and they have to buy Philadelphia television, the two main markets outside of their state, so there's a lot of waste, but the advertising cost is very high. And so, indeed, if we don't watch ourselves, on the very topic that you all are discussing in this conference, the cost of campaigns are ultimately going to draw what we've already seen, very wealthy candidates who can afford <coughs> to self-fund their campaigns. You brought up the 2000 election, which brought back some sad feelings for me. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and not wanting to wallow in the past too much, I had one question for you. Uh, during the process of the vote counting, the electoral votes, it only takes one senator and one representative to object to a certain vote count, as we saw in Ohio this past year. And I'm, during the 2000 election, there was no so shortage of representatives willing to object. And I'm w wondering why you didn't object to the counting of votes in 2000. You saw Fahrenheit 9-11. And that's exactly right. That's the implication that Fahrenheit 9-11 gives you. But obviously, there must be an answer why the issue was. Now, this is the Constitution provides for the collecting and reporting of the electoral votes of the state. And it's done in a joint session of Congress. And the Constitution provides that a member of Congress, a, a representative, will stand up and ask for an investigation into the votes. Now, why did not any one of 100 senators second that in December of 2000? There must be a reason. What was portrayed in Fahrenheit 9-11 is that nobody had the guts to. But why wouldn't uh, Hillary Clinton, or why wouldn't, uh, why wouldn't Tom Daschle, or Harry Reid, or Bill Nelson? Because Al Gore said it was over, and he asked us not to. Al Gore, the defeated candidate, said it's time to drop it. Let's let the rule of law proceed so that